Well, I am going to do the best that I can to make the idea of phenomenology and age value as exciting to you as possible for the post-lunch siesta time. So, <laughs> the worst um, slot. The but, worst slot. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, <laughs> I, I, I find this to be very intriguing and interesting, so I'm, I'm hoping you're, that you do, too. You're for a job, you just don't even show up. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, this is, this is something that I've been focusing on for quite a few years, and um, it's a passion that I have in trying to understand what is this really what is it that unique that we're trying to do in historic preservation in the historic environment? What is it that makes it unique about um, this idea of significance, authenticity, um, and really looking at you know how does the physical environment change, how does how do people's values change that are associated with that, and ultimately what I'm interested in is how does that impact planning practice. But I'm really trying to start here at a fundamental level and trying to understand what is this, the nature of age value? What is it, again, about the way that material changes over time that um, somehow imprints in us values, meanings, um, emotional responses? And so that's really what I'm gonna be focusing on here today. And it's very much related to memory. And what I'm gonna be getting into towards the end of this presentation is the idea of memory that's not necessarily rooted in historical facts. So. I don't think that's something we've really touched on a whole lot here uh, so far in this particular conference, but memories can be created uh, through different means, and that's part of what I'm going to be describing. So um, so I want to start here with a, what, what is phenomenology? Um, those of you who have maybe done a little studying and, and familiar with Norberg Schultz are probably familiar with one uh, form of phenomenology, hermeneutic phenomenology. My particular focus is on ex existential phenomenology, which uh, is, was originally uh, formed by Merleau Ponty, um, uh, a French philosopher. But I came across phenomenology in reference to the historic environment actually through the writings of a, uh, uh, an author by the name of Jack Elliott. And I, I think there's a musician out there by the same name, it's not the same person. Um, but Jack Elliott spent a lot of time looking at the personal, affective, emotional experiences of being in historic places. And he put that in counterbalance or counterpoint with uh, the way that preservation practice has been objectified in, through a doctrine, through the way that we're uh, supposed to be doing the practice of historic preservation. So what Elliot is advocating here is that we really need to take a phenomenological approach uh, to understand uh, ideas of what's, what's significant in, in preservation. Significance is really important. I think, you know, when, when we step back in, in those of us in historic preservation and we look at what we're doing in part, especially preservation planning, we are legally required to value place. That's kind of profound when you think about it. So embedded in laws at local, state, and federal levels, we are required to value place. What's not associated with that are really good methodologies for understanding that. We understand really well how experts can value place. We have architectural history we can look at. We can look at architectural theory and practice. The sociological side of it, cultural side of it, we're not so good at doing that. But this idea that we're legally required to value place, I think is very intriguing. And then of course, just through the practice of preservation, we are supposed to be looking at why places have value how they express their authenticity because we're looking at continuity. How can we bring what is the past is brought to us here in the present, how can we move that into the future? So with this idea of phenomenology, um, which really is uh, goes back to Heidegger at the turn of the 20th century, a German philosopher, um, his uh, student, Husserl, refined some of the ideas behind it. But what phenomenology is trying to do is it's looking at the essence of experience. So when you think of, for instance, you're sitting here in this room, how do you experience this room? The first things that you're experiencing, it has, it has to come through your body. And this is this concept of the life world. And let me pose this question to you. Can you experience the world without your body? Any, someone raise your hand if you think you can actually experience the world without your body. So, didn't expect anybody to raise their hand. If they did, I'd be very interested in the argument behind that. But we experience the world through our body, and this is what phenomenology is looking at, is the experience of being in places. And so it's a precognitive experience. So if you look at being in this room, you could describe being in this room in terms of 
uh, the, the temperature, the feel of the air against your skin, how, yeah, a little on the chilly side, you could um, uh, look at it in terms of um, how you feel sitting in the seat. Um, you could talk about your emotional state. So these are things like in the realm of perception. So you're not analyzing what you're perceiving. When the realm of experience moves into an analysis, it's no longer, you're no longer talking about experience. You're moving outside of the realm of what phenomenology is trying to do. Phenomenology is trying to look at the basic essence of perception and then trying to understand what that is without trying to analyze it. That's really the most fundamental way that I can describe this. But it is assuming that the only way that you can experience the world is through your body. So it's looking at the what's called the embodied experience of being in the life world. The life world being this dichotomy between you, the body, and what is out there. That's the life world. So there's that very strong emphasis on this idea of the life world. So, and Russell all defines this as the inner subjective space in which we experience everyday existence or being. Being in the world is a concept that goes back to Heidegger. So phenomenology, then if I can make this very succinct, is a study of the life world or the, or the study of subjective experience. So humanistic geographers have been looking at this for a very long time, since the early 1970s. Yi Fu Tuan is a, is a good example of looking at embodied experience in the world to understand place attachment or what sense of place is through emotional um, attachment to place. And that's where a lot of my research is looked at in terms of existential phenomenology. What is the emotional response in being in places? Because if you look at how people value place, you cannot divorce value of place from emotion. We're not robots, we're not machines. We need to understand how do you understand what that emotional reaction is. So if I kind of put phenomenology in context with other types of research methodologies out there, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. But it, uh, it, as I've already explained, it comes in the realm of philosophy, um, realist constructivism, if, uh, if you're uh, interested in, in going into more depth than that. Um, it's extensively used in humanistic geography, um, architecture, not so much, um, I would say, in a contemporary sense, but uh, certainly in the 80s and 90s it was uh, popular, if I could use that phrase. It's used extensively. Um, also in environmental psychology, it uh, tends to be used there. The methods you might be using to gather information, like how do you understand what people's experience of place is? Well, you can do uh, methods like interviews. Um, you can do reflections on literature, like a hermeneutic phenomenology, like what Norbert Schultz did, is more reflection on uh, that experience of being in place. So you can have a first-person um, phenomenology, you can have a third-person phenomenology. So there's different ways of looking at this. And again, it's revealing essential, in, in the context of the historic environment, it can reveal essential values associated with heritage. Pre-cognitive values, people's perception, and emotional connection with place. And the way that you try and understand this is through a process of qualitative coding to understand what those values and those meanings are, uh, divided up into patterns and themes that particularly make sense. And so some questions you might ask uh, in relevance to using phenomenology in the historic environment is, for instance, how does being in, in a certain place engender attachment to these places, to certain historic places? Um, what is the meaning of these places to the individual? Um, now, just referencing a few people there that um, are particularly relevant in uh, phenomenological techniques that you would use for gathering data. So I'm going to jump way back into the past and to uh, really the birth of uh, the Western ideas of historic preservation. I think the, some of my preservation uh, students here are probably pretty familiar with this with, uh, through Hassan's class. So I'm going to go back here to who is considered the father of historic preservation, John Ruskin. So if you actually read a lot of John Ruskin's uh, writings uh, back to um, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, The Lamp of Memory, he has a very... Um, emotionally affected uh, way of writing about, in, in his particular uh, object of attention, is um, Gothic cathedrals. And so he uses a lot of emotionally charged language, um, where he describes um, what he calls the golden stain of time, how surfaces change on historic buildings over time, um, as, uh, at least in him, uh, eliciting a feeling of mixed melancholy. So there's something there, he's, a, he's emotionally attached to these Gothic cathedrals and he's writing about that experience. So in some ways you could really think of, before we had terminology to describe this as a phenomenological, um, uh, relaying of a phenomenological experience, 
he was actually doing this to some extent. And he, he, he personifies buildings. Um, when he uses this uh, phrase that historic buildings have a deep sense of voicefulness, of stern watching, of mysterious sympathy, you know, again, this is emotionally laden language. This is a very personal, effective, very subjective experience that he's talking about here. He talks about how buildings change in relation to how um, humanity is passed over them. So I'm using an example here of, you know, probably uh, thousands and thousands of people here walked up these steps and left an imprint in them. John Ruskin is talking about his personal emotional response to seeing this and the feelings that he's getting from this particular kind of experience. So, and he talks about patina, what he refers to as the golden stain of time. And this is really, if you, if you think in this real simplistic dichotomy of the John Ruskin approach to saving everything in the built environment, all the layers of change, contrasting that with Villa Le Duc, you scrape back to a certain period of time to restore something. John Ruskin is clearly advocating for the retention of patina. Because in his personal experience, it's the patina that is attaching himself emotionally to those Gothic cathedrals. If you remove the patina, in John Ruskin's point of view, it ruins that emotional attachment to place. So, again, that's... The reason I'm relating this is that historic preservation theory really began in a very subjective area, looking at emotional experiences of being in historic places. And John Ruskin is part of the Romantic era, where you know, there's all sorts of paintings and artwork that look at the effectivist response of ruins, of patina, of ruinous spaces of decay. So, if you look at the popular perception of historic preservation and how people write about, talk about why historic places are valuable to them, it has a very strong sense of what John Ruskin, the way that John Ruskin wrote about it. People talk in everyday layman's language of emotional attachment to historic places. Um, I've given you an example here from 1917, um, a woman by the name of Mildred Cram talking about historic Charleston, uh, the birthplace of the nation's first historic district. Describing Charleston in terms of an object objective qualities in historic Charleston, um, but also um, of, she's saying that two thirds of historic Charleston is atmospheric, which is that emotional effective response, and only a third of it is objective or physical, is what she's relating. <clears throat> and I think looking at where historic preservation kind of made a split at the turn of the 20th century, and certainly by Colonial Williamsburg, uh, it was well on its way to taking an objective versus a subjective split. The um, subjective valuation of the built environment has continued from John Ruskin to the present and the layperson's um, everyday value system, but with the rise of Colonial Williamsburg and historical positivism and the scientific approach to history, uh, what you have is an objectification of um, values um, historic preservation practice. And I think I would put that in the context that uh, it needed to be done that way because we still have incredibly difficult time trying to understand how do you take personal emotional experiences and do something meaningful with that to like generalize it to a larger population. But I think Regal was really prescient, um, uh, early track in creating this dichotomy between what he referred to as age value and historical value. Value. What he's really referring to is age value, the personal, effective, emotional response of being in historic places versus historical value, facts, objective information that can be quantified, that can be described. So in his dichotomy, one is subjective, the other is objective or uh, in this era positivistic. So there's singular truths associated with it. One's emotional, the other is scientific, logical. Um, age value is very personal. Historical value is, is detached. It's the scientist observing the historic environment to objectively describe place. Regal was really, um, in its essence, looking at things phenomenologically before, again, Heidegger was really looking at how you might look at the embodied experience of being in place. Uh, uh, Regal specifically refers to age value as, quote unquote, addressing the emotions, addresses the emotions directly. So he was understanding in 1903 this idea that you could look at the value of the historic environment in terms of how it impacts your attachment to place, the emotional reaction that you have to place. And he framed historical value as resting on a scientific basis. So he is very clear in saying that historical value is objective, that you're using a scientific process to understand values associated with the historical environment. And I've already referenced Colonial Williamsburg. In, in Western preservation practice, certainly here in the United States, 
the um, historical value that Regal is talking about here was very much set in place by the 1930s by the time Colonial Williamsburg came along. And that particular approach was codified in preservation doctrine that we have. Uh, that's still guiding preservation practice to this day. So these are, these are things like um, the Venice Charter from 1964, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, originally created in 1976, um, the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's really only been in the past couple of decades that preservation doctrine has been looking at um, pluralism and uh, the idea of personal effective responses to place, cultural values as being important to place. So, but we still have this fairly strong thread to the present that preservation doctrine is based on historical value and not age value. And again, because we have a really difficult time understanding what is this thing that we call the age value. Well, I've already mentioned Merleau-Ponty, and so um, he is credited with creating this existential phenomenology, a strand of phenomenology, looking at the embodied experience of being in place um, and how that is described. And I picked up this particular passage because it's very interesting in how he's talking about how memory affects him and the relationship between the object and memory. What Merleau-Ponty is clearly making evident here is that that memory or that significance is rest in himself. It's not in the object. And that's something that traditional preservation doctrine has not made so clear. We assume, for instance, in the way that um, uh, National Register of Historic Places looks at historical value, somehow the object contains the values. Merleau-Ponty is very specific in saying, no, no, the values are in us. And so that's where when you're moving towards age value, that's the direction that we're looking at as an interpretation of value in the built environment, is that it can be independent of the object. So, one thing that I think is very interesting is that there's been a lot of, uh, well, a decent amount of work uh, on phenomenology of built environments. Uh, there's a few authors, authors here that I've mentioned before, Tuan and Ralph are humanistic geographers, Casey Mal Malpas, a farmer in Knapp, and Stefanovic have been looking at um, existing built environments um, in terms of phenomenology, but there's really not a lot of uh, phenomenology works out there and research that's been done in the historic environment. So um, this is clearly an area that needs to be looked at, um, which is, again is one of the reasons why I'm interested in looking at this. So, so I've been talking about this thing called age value, so what is it? So let me, let me do a little description here to give you a background on what this is. So, Age value is part of the life world. It's that experience of being in historic places. And so, um, I'm going back here to, to Jack Elliott where he describes that the physical age of places as evidence in the way that materials change over time evoke experiences of awe and wonder. So that's that emotional response that happens being embedded in an historic place. Um, Applebaum looks at this experience in terms of authenticity that we understand that objects are authentic when not only it is old from an objective standpoint, but it looks old and we like that it looks old. So there's something about authenticity that has this um, very hard to describe and very hard to quantify aspect of our emotional reaction to it. It feels old to us, right? So why does it feel old to it? How does it feel old to us? Well, Delyser did some really, this is, Delyser is a sociologist, did some really interesting work in looking at patina and authenticity in ghost towns in the American West. And he clearly was talking about the patina of ghost towns which was related to everyday people's experience of those ghost towns in terms of being an authentic place. So the patina is related to how um, places are perceived and that relates to age value. And so, let's go back to Regal and how Regal defines age value. He defined it back in 1903 as, quote, an imperfection, a lack of completeness, a tendency to dissolve shape and color, and decay and disintegration. So he's talking about decay, and I'm showing you an example. This is actually a, a door from Eastern State Penitentiary that hasn't been painted for like seven decades. So this is obviously decay. But is it patina? What's, what's the difference? We need to look in terms of trying to understand when we say what is decay in the, in, the, in the built environment, what's good decay, what's bad decay, we need to define the range of the decay. decay. So you can have decay that's entirely complete, which is represented here on the right-hand side. If we take, for instance, a brick, and if a brick is sufficiently old, it will crumble into a pile of dust. It's not readable. We don't understand that it's a brick. 
Um, so if it's something that's not understandable and readable, it has no meaning to us. That's the opposite end of the spectrum from something that's entirely new. There's no decay to it. We certainly understand what it is, for instance, a brick, but because it doesn't have any signs of decay, it lacks authenticity from the age value or phenomenological sense because it doesn't feel authentically old to us. So we're looking at some place here in the middle, whatever that might be, where things are old because time, through time, uh, surfaces change. That material is some readability to it, so we understand still what it is. It has an increased amount of complexity to it through those decayed surfaces, and we feel that or perceive that as being actually authentic. So patina is a positive sense of decay. So patina's, patina happens naturally over time. If it's produced by human beings, we can call that a patination process, but in historic preservation, we don't like people changing objects to make them look old. That's a falsification of history. If nature does that change, that's a positive thing. Um, so authenticity is not affected by at least in preservation theory, by nature changing objects. But people changing objects is not such a good thing. So Edmundsdorf talks about all sorts of interesting permutations of what decay is and how patina manifests itself. But I thought it would be kind of useful to kind of put this in a flow chart, how we define what is patina, what is decay, and give this sort of a uh, process here. So if, if the change to objects in the environment happens through nature, through entropy, we can interpret that as decay if it's too much or if it's unpleasant. I'll give you some examples. If we interpret it positively, it's patina. This is desirable. We want to keep that. If, for instance, um, humans, through a patination process, we create fake decay, you can think of it in that sort of a term, it's a forgery. We're not making things authentically old. It's not really old. But it still could be termed and uh, thought of in terms of a positive sense if it's something that we do want. If you were a bronze, if you were storing a bronze statue, you want to put a patina back on the statue that was there in order to preserve the object. You're still doing a patination process to create a patina, but that, through that interpretation process, is something that you want to keep. So we have all this interpretation. Is it decay or patina? So um, concrete, for instance, is it decay or patina? I mean, this is up to individual interpretation. Um, if you have a uh, old concrete wall that has all these sorts of lime deposits coming through it with a bit of algae, is that decay or patina? Plastic, man-made materials, polymers, if they decay, is that positive or negative? These are empirical questions that we don't have answers to. I think these are very interesting. I can say that probably without having to do a lot of studies, animal decay is not something that we necessarily desire, but it's certainly in this realm of looking at um, the difference between patina and decay. Plant decay, maybe that is positive. If we have um, an ancient ruin here, its authenticity perhaps is enhanced by what appears to be a very old, craggy tree with the roots growing over it in an organic nature. It just looks like it's been there for a very long period of time. Slime molds, plant decay, from an aesthetic standpoint, as David Lowenthal talks about here, maybe that is something that's positive, depending on your particular interpretation. Um, moss, um, uh, replacing mortar uh, around bricks, maybe that's aesthetically pleasing. Maybe that's something, not only does it tell us it's authentically old, but that's something that we want to keep. So again, that's a positive interpretation. And I think ruins are really interesting places to look at how much is just enough decay? How much is too much decay? In other words, how much uh, change happens where patina turns into decay? Um, so um, in what, what realm do cultural interpretations play in that, of what's acceptable or not, as, as Dickinson talks about? So, so we're talking, so I'm getting on a track here of talking about how the physical age of the historic environment relates to memory. And so ruins, again, looking at sort of the, the ultimate or penultimate example of um, age value in the built environment and how that elicits memory, um, Ginsberg talks here about how ruins can be poetic, magical places. And he actually comes up with a really interesting phrase here called ruin mood, that somehow this inspires some sort of fantasies or creativity um, through the experience of the authentic age of these particular places. Um, Malpas talks about how 
Um, the patina of landscape on a broader scale relates to cultural memory in a storehouse of ideas. As you're passing through a cultural landscape and you perceive it as authentically real, it somehow is telling you a story as you're going along through it. Um, Malpas also talks about this idea of nostalgia and how somehow this patina of environments and age values that's expressed through that um, can relate to memory that's not objectively related to facts about place. Um, so we're talking about potentially a realm of fantasy and there's obviously a value-laden system that goes on top of that. So, um, <clears throat> but what there's a recognition here, if you look at the literature on this, is that, as, like as Harrison talks about here, is that ruin and decay in the historic environment um, somehow evoke this emotional response of what uh, Harrison here calls being affected by the past. And it's somehow related to creative experiences, to this fantasy um, of somehow creating memories that didn't necessarily objectively exist in the past. Um, and I think um, Robert Riley, who is a landscape uh, architect, really described this really well in terms of what he calls an internal fantasy landscape, that as you experience what you perceive as an authentic patina in landscape as being authentically real, it leads to what he calls, quote, an internally experienced landscape that is far richer and more personal than the real landscape. So he's actually talking about here about that experience of being in a historic environment through that creative process of somehow engendering a fantasy as being uh, more, uh, creating a, a stronger emotional attachment to that place than if you actually knew about the objective uh, facts about the place. So I, what I did in my research is I looked at what, um, what these people are looking at in terms of this creative space that's evoked by the historic environment through this sense of age value that Regal originally described um, and applying it to the historic environment um, I came up with this term of spontaneous fantasy which really describes this experience through the work that I've done in informants um, in historic Charleston in particular about the experience that they actually described and I'm going to uh, show that to you here in a second here. So the Lyser in his study of ghost towns in the American West touched on this a little bit about um, how visitors that are going to these ghost towns are experiencing what he called a fantasy past that never may have been but, another, but nevertheless holds meaning for each person who imagines it. So just because these aren't real factual events that people are imagining it doesn't mean that these are important experiences to people. And so going back to the study that I mentioned um, so I did a study, a phenomenological study, um, and the method that I used to gather the data was interviews, but I used a photo elicitation process. And what I did is I gave my informants, who were residents of Historic Charleston, disposable cameras, with instructions to photograph, <coughs> excuse me, um, anything in their neighborhood, I gave them a clear boundary, that was particularly meaningful to them. The only two limitations I gave them is no photographs of people, no photographs of animals. Didn't give them any reference on any scale or any types of objects. So what did they give me back? They mailed the cameras back, I developed the film, I set up interviews with them, and it was a fantastic experience because all I did is I gave them their photographs and I said, tell me what you were thinking when you took the photograph. And then I shut up and they talked to me for like an hour and I just listened. So it's a great qualitative experience. So my students that might end up doing this kind of work, great experience because they're essentially, my informants are teaching me about their experience. Huge number of these photographs came back in terms of uh, like what Roger, uh, an informant here, described. He was walking down the street in a store Charleston, saw this particular building, he was holding his disposable camera up and when he, when he was snapping that frame to take this picture, he was describing in his mind's eye that he saw Civil War soldiers marching up these steps. He was, not he, he was very clear to tell me that he had no idea if Civil War soldiers ever marched up these steps. So there was no objective past that he was referencing here. It was a spontaneous event that happened. He described it in terms that it was not premeditated. There was something about this environment that put in his mind's eye, spontaneously, a vignette from the past. Hence the term spontaneous fantasy. In a similar sense, Dave took this particular photograph, uh, describing that as he was crouching down, taking a photograph of, uh, these are like little ruts, and the flagstones here, about in his mind's eye, he saw cotton wagons rolling up the street uh, to some distant cotton warehouse. Again, he had no idea if there was ever a cotton warehouse down the street or even what kind of vehicles walk, rolled down the street. But these are the experiences that my informants described to me over and over and over again, 
and they framed it in the reference that this is what emotionally attached him to Historic Charleston. It was the reason why the residents of Historic Charleston believed that their neighborhood was significant. So I'm going to leave you here with a really open-ended question that I'm still trying to struggle with. If this is getting us closer, and I think there's a lot more work that needs to happen here, to understanding everyday people's experience of being in historic environments to help us understand how significant and value of these places might be informed, um, how do we take this and use this? Especially in a sense that we tend to want objective information to influence infill construction in historic places, design guidelines. Um, what do we do with this information? So that's where I'm going to leave it here today. Thank you. Can I just, I, I start with something which is to do with the reshaping of the imaginary said with the Holocaust. And one of the things we were looking at was 9-11, which is the next kind of much more uh, instant and much more much closer to us than a lot of people who are no longer alive at that time or are soon not to be alive. And the other thing is that that was done through the the, um, the communication of it was done through newsreels right, at one stage. Now, of course, we're in a stage where everything was instant. Everything was bombarded. You saw it at almost, almost as, as things happened. Um, so it changes this this question about what does that mean to us in terms of well, not just democratization of death, but how do we deal with something like that? Because we don't have the distance to look at it critically or in any way. So the memories are very new. Um, so I'm just curious what you feel because of the, that change. Sure. Um, I, I mean, one of the one of the sort of prime. Uh, means of delivering the message of this museum, the 9-11 Museum, is, you know, the proliferation of visual materials. Uh, and the idea is that hundreds of millions, maybe more, uh, of people watch this in real time as it was happening. So at some point, it, it certainly is an assault on the imagination. I mean, there too, you have something created. It's a creative act, uh, an imagined act that uh, sets a new category. And that is what the assault on the imagination essentially does. Uh, it, I think in the sense of, nine, in the case of 9-11 and Baudrillard, some of the French writers went on after this. I mean, they analyzed 9-11 not as sort of a historical event, but as a spectacle, mm -hmm. as something that, you know, sort of created both a sense of detachment and almost a sense of unreality as you're watching, uh, which is because of the closeness to the event, because seeing it in real time, unlike the camp newsreels, uh, it's possible to do that. And because our culture has become, in any case, you know, so saturated with images of spectacular violence, uh, you know, we're told, for example, that you know, one of the difficulties of showing they showed this image of the planes hitting the towers and the towers falling again and again and again. And, you know, young children who saw that actually thought it was happening anew each time. They didn't realize it was being shown to them. So I think the, the proximity of the immediacy of media is a transformative element in that piece of it. I'm curious because when you talk, Steve, about that you had to fit into a narrative I, got, I seem to suggest, it seems to suggest that you had to fit in your architecture into a narrative that is written by somebody else. No, we, there was no narrative. So you, developed. when you said you, I wanted to do these specific things in the space, which were important to you, it was based on a narrative that you had set up. So there that wasn't had, a narrative. No, we had to imagine a narrative because it hadn't been developed yet. So you had to design before the empty space. We had to imagine what the narrative might be and how it could transform over time. So somebody else was now going to, are they going to design the museum after you finish it? Or are you part of that design? Because you've thought of a narrative. That's a chicken and egg kind of yeah, but question, I'm, I think. I'm curious.
it was an iterative thing. I don't know that it had, uh, I don't think it had a structure which I can really describe, which makes it, unique is a word that has no modification, there's no, it, something is either unique or it isn't. This was a unique situation where we were developing a design for what we knew would have a narrative, <laughs> but we right. didn't know what that narrative was going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, because of the very unique circumstances of this site, mm -hmm. the actual reconstruction began before the program for the museum and others was created. And, you know, the, the story of real estate at Ground Zero, yeah, as opposed to memory at Ground Zero, uh, is a whole different narrative. But, you know, that's... In a sense, we were the guardians of something we knew was coming. But we didn't exactly know what it was. We just knew what the, what the resources that we could utilize were. But you decided to go down to bedrock and all that. You know, you decided to go through, expose certain things. That is a decision. That is a, not just an architectural decision. I think decision. that's a decision that, that, that actually not. came out of Daniel Liebskin's master plan. Okay, so it was, okay. Initially, so I would. The story wall, certainly, you know. So that idea and of and that image there. of his idea of the memorial being the site remaining so, yeah. okay. essentially unreclaimed. And then you took it up. And well, then there was the competition by which right. Michael Arad right. and Peter Walker right. won. Right. Uh, and it had an element, uh, a very uh, discreet element at, at Bedrock. And then we began to understand that there was more available. Hmm. So we began to work with it. Then, 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 the, then, the, then the structure of the museum began to uh, develop. I don't remember who was the first in. It was you or Alice, and it was very. It was, I think it was probably you. I, in the earliest stage, probably was. Yeah, yeah. No, I was there before she was. Uh, but you know, the plan, the plan had to catch up with the design. Okay. It just did. It just did. Well, you mean the narrative had to catch up? Right. With it. Yeah. 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 Erica, had some. Thank you both for your papers. They, they very nicely intersected, and, and uh, I really appreciate the, the sort of theoretical guidance from both. I'd like to combine them by asking a question about ruins. Um, because right after 9-11, there was some discussion, of course, about, well, what do we do with this space in the midst of body recovery, et cetera? Um, what about ruins? And, and it, as you recall, very quickly, the New York Times, by the end of September, had published a piece in which a lot of artists and architects and designers were asked, well, what would you do with this space? And several proposed the idea of, of ruins, whether from a bit of the facade, et cetera. And, and this was found untenable, and um, you know, the approach to cleaning and then rebuilding, although the ruins themselves will now be a significant part of the, of the display inside. I'm just wondering if you might both reflect on the sort of the aberration for ruin at this moment um, in, in terms of building a memorial to the ruins um, of these two uh, gigantic buildings in the world. Well, I think the interesting thing is, and there's been a number of people who've uh, discussed this, that um, in, in Western culture, and maybe particularly American culture, uh, we don't like ruins so much. Um, you know, and it's a larger question, should ruins potentially be turned into memorials? I mean, there's pragmatic aspects, you kind of touched on them, like maintenance issues. I mean, they're solvable. I mean, uh, the UK has a, a pretty well-known program for trying to conserve its archaeological remnants, uh, you know, with some above ground remnants that are left. But um, I think it's in recognition that there is something about ruins that are particularly poignantly evocative. I mean, uh, I mean, there's there's got to be a reason why, for instance, I mean, if you look at the programming that happens at Eastern State Penitentiary, for instance, it is a preserved ruin. If you haven't been there, it's amazing from that perspective. But um, it's interesting if you look at the programming and how that site generates most of its income, it's actually through the um, Halloween. Uh, the Halloween tour. Um, and so it's, you know, you could look at it, it's, it's, it's not really true to its, its, its history, but it's really capitalizing in the evocative quality of, this is a pretty scary place. Um, it's a prison, you know, and people's memories go wild on that as an aspect. So 
runes can be very evocative, and I, I, you know, I'm just speculating that maybe we're not comfortable with that, we're with uh, and that emotional of a connection with the past. We want it mediated more than that. That would be what I would say. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think you're right, and then I wonder whether or not, you know, as I was saying before, that you know, wanting that distance has been overtaken by sort of the spectacular nature of what people witnessed. So um, we have a lot of you know, artifacts and remnants of the destruction in the museum. But I spoke before about you know, the conflict between real estate and memory. Uh, you know, that was such that you know, the, the, the range of proposals for that site in the immediate aftermath was you know, leave an empty hole in lower Manhattan to rebuild the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think the rebuilding the Twin Towers was more likely, never terribly likely, but more likely than, than leaving a hole in the ground uh, because of the real estate demands of all of that. Uh, even to the point that there was something called the Koenig Sphere on the plaza of the World Trade Center. It was this 25 foot sort of, uh, you know, sphere of the earth. And, you know, it's sort of a some slightly abstracted sculpture. Anyway, it, it wasn't destroyed. It was damaged. It wasn't destroyed. And there are people who would like that to be back at the plaza level at, at the World Trade Center because it's a surviving artifact, though very damaged. And there are others who say there's no way, uh, this is not what we want to see when we're trying to rebuild a neighborhood. So the, you know, the issue has not gone away. Um, I think that we're entering a really interesting time as um, in the next few years as these 9-11 projects begin to come to a close and we begin to understand that the landscape of that area, individuals who were born the day after 9-11 will be entering high school and 10th, 11th grade and will begin to have intelligent conversations about that time in our history that they, they never lived it themselves. So um, I guess how do we begin to reconcile conversations about this time in history with those who never bore witness to it, and how does that relate to previous events such as the assassination of J JFK, that kind of thing? Um, so I guess it's kind of more of a comment, but I guess I might need to get your um, comment on that, um, how you begin to have discussions about this event with um, young individuals who are influenced by this, and th this event becomes very important to their, um, as, as they grow up and enter into the world. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we're trying to build an education program and, you know, every day that we don't have one is another day that, you know, there's another 100,000 students who don't remember this. Um, the point I think we have to make is that this altered the world that they come into. I mean, it really did change the imaginary that would allow them to think of the world in a certain way. And uh, even if the attack on the towers is done and the rebuilding is complete, whenever that is. You know, we went to war twice and then elsewhere. We have a different balance on civil liberties and security. Uh, you know, we have a different relationship to the world because of that and they will inherit, for better or for worse, whatever that is. And uh, I think one of the things, again, you know, we're I think we're much more conscious of how to do these things than maybe was the case uh, 50 years ago. This whole field of memory studies and the focus on, you know, how does a society remember, that, that was sort of not really much of a, a focus. If we'd done this museum 30 years ago, we'd, we'd have done a different project. But now, there really is a professional audience for this, not just a general audience. And uh, there is an awareness, and the kids themselves incorporate this awareness. You know, if there are attentive students, they realize the value of history, but also the immediacy of this event. And maybe because of the media, it's those two things, history and immediacy, somehow combine. Um, Thanks, Steve, did you have a No, I just wanted Steve. to add to, to, to Erica's question, is that, this, that the documentation was so extensive of the site, and, and there were so many spectacular images. There's, I, I think the one that you're thinking of is the one with the, with the series of trident steel pieces um, shot from. But, and, ruins, that's the right, but 
that, that's the image I think that many people have uh, in their mind's eye about, about the ruin. Um, it's, a, it's, it's almost the raising of the flag at Edimo Jim. It's, it's, it's one, of those, one of those moments. There was no hesitation to remediate that site. There wasn't, there wasn't a breath of a pause. So those snapshots that were taken, you know, th that's what they were. They were snapshots. They were wartime snapshots. And there were almost 3,000 families demanding the continued search for, for remains. So, so it, would have, it, was, well, it would have been impossible <coughs> because you were searching, you would have had to reconstruct the ruin if that's how you were going to do it. I mean, some people, I remember, I can't remember if it was an artist or an architect, but imagined, um, well, remember the rubble um, at the end of the war in Berlin? But and we couldn't possibly have done that because there was still the ongoing rescue operation. Um, so that imagination of ruin was impossible. Um, but it was part of the conversation. There, there was also the very real possibility that the, the western bathtub wall, which is now called the slurry wall, would fail. And the thing that sustained that wall was the weight of the debris, and, and as it was removed, the wall, it, it, it's a ferry. It, it, was, it was really chaotic. Bob, well, um, I think someone needs to uh, talk about the juxtaposition of these two uh, statements. Um, my initial instinct is they occupy opposite poles, and there's no bridging the gap. Um, between spontaneous fantasy and the seriousness of uh, the operation of redemption and, and the aftermath of uh, or the, the redeeming imagination after the Holocaust. Um, but then the mention of shaman uh, brings to mind the possibility of uh, of exactly that, the employment of mad imagination, which is not so foreign from spontaneous fantasy. Um, we have used simulacra, uh, and I, I'm curious about, Jeremy, where that falls in there, because we use simulacra in the most negative connotation. Uh, but then Simon Shama's uh, fictional uh, imagining of history, of, of historic events, not to cheapen them, but actually to enrich them. I and mean, it's, it's a very controversial act, what he's done as a historian. But um, is there a way to, um, is there a role for a, a Shama-like operation of imagination that doesn't cheapen uh, history? Uh, the, maybe the issue of some like Well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the directions I've taken this a little bit further is to try and understand what what is it about patina or specific physical elements of the built environment that seem to engender spontaneous fantasy. So I'm looking at the, what's the catalyst for it, rather than trying to focus on what that particular imaginary experience is like. In terms of if 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 we're trying, if one of the goals of historic preservation is to try and preserve significance and authenticity at least that most stakeholders perceive then if we still focus on the fabric of the built environment we're trying to maybe preserve the ability for it to do these uh, spontaneous fantasies but we're not really I'm not I mean preservation well if you look at the, the writings of the architects in Colonial Williamsburg in the 30s they clearly recognized that this idea of fantasy was was part of uh, restoration attempts and they vilified it I mean extensively and it's really why uh, preservation practice went on a very positivistic track until like the past decade or two uh, because we weren't really prepared to open this door of subjectivity and you know many people still aren't really sure what to do with it um, so but on the other hand if you look in terms of creativity I mean yes I think in, we're, we are really in some ways an opposite ends of the spectrum um, it's really quite interesting the juxtaposition but if you look at like uh, in terms of like Jane Jacobs or even Richard Florida and how they look at the historic environment in terms of uh, creativity you know, I mean, with Jane Jacobs that says, we need old buildings for new ideas, right? So, you know, this threat has been in our culture to some extent. That there's something about the historic environment that is involved with creativity. Um, and, you know, 
at ways to look at it. Julian, please. Jumping up here. Oh. <laughs> no, if, if you allow me a, a little detour, I think there, there's a stronger connection that in the two presentations, you know, uh, and, and I'd like to do it this way. The first, the first is that, uh, in a certain way, the question of imagination is, is significant because, you know, uh, as James Young clearly pointed, you know, we're talking about vicarious memories. So there are memories that, we, you know, post-memory, as Marianne Hirsch talked about, you know, in terms of Holocaust uh, kind of representation. Or, or, or. So uh, James says, you know, that, that, that one of the things that is important is that, that uh, uh, is memory work itself the difficult attempt to know, to imagine vicariously, and to make meaning out of experiences we never knew directly that constitutes the object of memory? At least, you know, so one of the three things. And, and that memory work, at least in the context of the Holocaust, should be anti redemptive. And this is a very important thing, you know, so to ask ourselves, you know, could we attempt to redeem history through our work? I don't think so myself. I, I don't think that's the role of architecture or art, you know sort of to, to redeem history, you know. Leo Bersani said that the catastrophes of history appear to matter much less if they are somehow redeemed through, through art. And I think there's a problem with that, with that idea. Yet, the question of imagination and creativity is a very different thing. It's not about redemption. It's about learning. And it's about how to, how to address the questions that come from histories or traumatic histories that perhaps is the, is the kind of the question of you know, educational principles. Is it about telling the story? You know, the issue is what means do we use to tell the story? Because sometimes we are told, you know, that to tell a story <coughs> means to kind of have a specific narrative, perhaps a one a single, single narrative, you know, authoritative narrative that tells us a story, you know, with dates and facts and you know numbers and, and, and all of that. Yet, it's very difficult to imagine. You know, and that goes to what you what you were presenting. You know, in terms of phenomenology and in terms of addressing this. And and I think what Cliff, what you showed in terms of the images. Why is it that this collection of images will be at the Holocaust Museum in or in in in, uh, in Illinois? You know, beyond the question that you were asked to do it, there's something powerful about the the, the value of the image itself or the imagination and the juxtaposition of that as a collection. You know, and that is to me what starts to be surfacing in many of the works that we attempt to do is how do we look at the archives of materials which are not only historical archives, data, let's put it this way, but other things. And, and, and I think, you know, Ernst van Alphen, you know, a, a writer a while ago suggested something quite interesting about learning, you know, in the context of traumatic histories. And he used examples of Sbirinio Libera, you know, to look at play. You know, look at the specifics of you know spontaneous and imaginative works that con conduct the mind of those who did not experience the story, you know, to imagine themselves as part of it. You know. and, and there are lots of things you know kind of discuss about this, but I think there's you know just there's a strong connection between these two you know presentations, you know, uh, you know, as a kind of a round uh, discussion between the kind of question of phenomenology and the question of the impossibility of knowing, you know, and the way that we perceive it. I'm going to suggest that we open this up to any of the other issues that you want to take up, <coughs> which may be the same ones as well, continue them on. It was going to be, we were going to do a panel with four or five people, but I think the panel is actually scattered in the room, so we let the panel remain where they are. And uh, if that's all right, and we'll just have a, have a conversation and ask you to give some thoughts um, as, I wouldn't say wrap up, but some thoughts about what you felt you've experienced, um, what you think has been important. I'd be curious to get reactions from people. If you still want to have a panel discussion, I'm happy with that too, by the way. But I think if you're, we have got a panel, they've all been talking at the moment, the same, same panel. So it's all right. So we'll uh, leave you where you are, but ask for your sort of last sets of comments and ideas. If there are any thoughts, I have some. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'd like to actually start essentially by um, reacting to the the two presentations, the most current ones, um, and. Um, 
me, um, what's interesting in both of them is that um, as much with the experiment that Jeremy did um, with Charleston as with the representation of um, uh, all of these different genocides is that neither of uh, them could have taken place without the, um, the media, the, actually the new media. So um, even with the Civil War, the, the idea that somebody imagined as soldiers standing there must have actually been evoking, you know, th we have a massive um, photographic archive from the Civil War. And that um, in that person's memory are all of these images floating around. And so uh, somehow or another, they, they get activated in these particular locations. So in addition to the spaces, we actually have uh, the ghost towns are peopled by the characters of the films. The um, Civil War soldiers pop up in different locations. Uh, the, um, uh, 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 the newsreels of uh, Treblinka, etc., you know, are forever with us, um, and they're constantly rerun. I mean, it's not that, that um, and because it's totally reproducible, uh, even uh, the youngest uh, people were saying, well, there will be a generation very soon that, uh, you know, did not see the, the images on the screen of the, um, of the towers coming down. Nonetheless, th uh, these um, mediated, powerful mediations of essentially photography and its regeneration in moving uh, images, actually I think um, not only quantitatively but qualitatively change our nature of, uh, of the imaginary. I, I cannot see that it, that's not the case. At least um, I would put it to you to, to, that we really need to consider this seriously. I mean really seriously. <coughs> we have not done that homework yet. So that's sort of a, a kind of a my response to the two of you, but actually, it's I, I think it's a, it's a question to everybody. Uh, again, um, um, having come out of having done you know a very different kind of project on the Jerba project, I've come to understand this that um, it's exactly the opposite of secret knowledge. The secret knowledge of that particular sect that you know sort of kept it back, uh, and so on. Uh, we are in a state of uh, constant reiteration via these mediated images. I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know what anybody else thinks about this. And, oh, yeah. and therefore, uh, the phenomenological t uh, ladder uh, and, and the description that you have uh, sort of so clearly laid out to us, starting with Husserl and Olive, but everybody coming down the line, I'm not sure that. Um, that early on they even considered this, even though all of these people already lived in the age of photography. Mm. I mean, I think it's worth, because we are all such visual people, we really need to attack it uh, from exactly the neuro um, cognitive, you know, direction. I mean, it is really different. You know, if you did an fMRI on all of us, you will, you know, something else would be lighting up. I can't imagine that it wouldn't. Well, I think we're talking about a very interesting question. I mean, that's why I think, um, in fact, it's kind of a good plug maybe for, there's an Environmental Design Research Association conference happening here in Providence <laughs> in about a week. I'm the co-chair of that, which actually focuses on these things. Basically, yeah. um, looking at environment, how it impacts people, environmental psychology, and experimental methods are part of I mean, you're, what you're bringing up here as questions are things that can't be answered. And people have looked at that yeah. um, and other aspects of the built environment, uh, not specifically historic environments, mm -hmm. which or, or environments uh, that you could sort of have, you know, memory associated with them, memorials and things like that. So I, I'm not sure if anybody's aware of any studies like that. I, I'm not off hand, mm -hmm. but um, it's potentially an answerable question to some extent. Well, I, I'll say something which may be um, provocative in some way. We've had a lot of discussion on this question of memory. And it kind of it worries me that it seems to have overtaken our, our conversation, that memorials have become so important. We have memorials for everything. 
and you wonder where does it stop? Where do you keep? Where do memorials go? Okay, there may be some very important things, which are important to society. On the other hand, the little marker on the side of the road is very important to the family who lost a child or whatever it is. And yet we're going more and more memories. And I think Eric and I had a short um, exchange on this yesterday, where one wondered whether. Um, we're so obsessed with memory because we're, f we're afraid that we'll be forgotten. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what does it matter if we're forgotten? Because as you said, it's now become democratization of, in the old days, hundreds of people did die. And they died anonymously. And now we want to actually save people for something, for remembering them in some certain way. And in the day of resurrection, we all get resurrected and somebody will say, you know, you're good and you're an art and I guess someone else. But so I'm, I worry about this question of, of memory in the sense, I mean, which is one of the reasons why we thought about doing this, because what is that legacy we take with us? And there is a change in our mindset somewhere that's happening at the moment. That's why the new landscape and legacy, the title comes out of some of that. He says we're trying to talk about memory through architecture and art or whatever it is, historic preservation. But it really becomes something that's, it worries me. It worries me as a, just as a general subject. And I don't know what, if anyone else has got any reactions to, to this feeling. Erica. Well, I think in this, in this country, and since I'm an Americanist, I, I can speak best to this country. But you've got two factors right now. One is the, the emphasis on celebrity. Celebrity not necessarily with having done anything or created something um, uh, to, to benefit uh, society, politics, culture, but just plain up celebrity. And there have been so many polls of, of kids in high school, what do you want to be? I want to be famous. And it's not necessarily for being a sports star or a politician, I just want fame. So I think we have to think about that. The second part of this, and, and it's and it's equally important is that if we're going to live in a democracy such as ours, and we're really going to respect rights, um, particularly with the gain of, the, of, of civil rights on all sorts of levels in the past 50 years, then we have to respect that for many people making a memorial is the representation of rights entitlements, rights entitlement in, in public culture or public cultures. So I wouldn't want to give it away or say no. I, um, there's, there's one scholar who writes on memorials who has proposed a 10-year moratorium on memorial making in Washington, D.C. And, and I, I would, I'm very opposed to that because what about the, the people in that 10-year period? And, you know, forget it, they don't get anything. But I do think we have a problem with the, um, with the celebrity, me, fame, without having really done anything or contributed to um, the culture. Can I? Um, my first thought was, where was that guy when we needed him? <laughs> but never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, two things about this memorial craze. Um, I'm not convinced that it will continue indefinitely. I mean, you know, if you look at the memorials of the past, they were phenomena in their own times. The Cenotaph in London mm -hmm. for the dead of world. I couldn't find it. I asked uh, uh, Bobby to direct me. He didn't know where it was, and it was around the corner. I mean, they'd line up in hundreds of thousands to visit it when it was relevant, and things change. And now we live in a culture, highly memorialized, in which, you know, sort of these abstract art expressions are the way mem memorials are made. I don't know that they're going, I mean, they meet the need of the time, and then if the time changes, then something else happens. The other thing in relation to memory, and this, I think, is um, we've also been doing work with neuroscientists on memory. I mean, it's sort of a multidisciplinary yeah. project of memory. And, and one of the things that is so interesting about what the brain science uh, is revealing is that the links between memory and the imagination are very close. Yes. So these are not sort of opposites. These are the way you think about the past is very in your literally in the biology of your brain is very similar to the way you think about the future, and as we know, sort of memory is in fact recreated each time it's recalled, and it's done in a way that you know it, it involves different phenomena than just this binary between what's behind us and what's in front of us is not 
is not reflective of the way the, the brain actually works on these things. So I think they are very closely tied together. And you know, this is part of the human dimension of what we're talking about. But nonetheless, yeah. here's the interesting issue that um, the, um, the insertion of this vast photographic stream okay, really qualitatively changes our human memory. I mean, collectively. I, I really, I mean, to me, it's just so, so clear. Uh, um, and this is in spite of the fact that in various burial ceremonies you have the constant refrain, eternal memory, eternal memory. It's true. You go to any funeral and sooner or later there is the constant refrain of eternal memory, which is probably a pious hope only. I mean, was a pious hope only in that sense. We now have a, uh, exactly like that soldier on the imagined on the on the staircase. Hmm. You know, we now recreate spaces hmm. peopled with images that can't come from, you know, another whole stream. So, uh, in in fact, cognitively, I do believe that it's really not like anything prior. I was going to say back to the whole the whole issue of like taking credit or you know wanting that fame or memorials. In a sense, we've, we've always done them from, like, you can think back to kings of Egypt. A pyramid is just a giant memorial, in some sense a monument, but it's also completely abstract and completely not. In the sense of actual, you know, uh, funerals and, and graves, in a sense, that's for people to remember you and to pay their respects, but it's also, you know, in, in that sense, it's that memorial to yourself and you can put whatever you want as your epitaph or whatever and or you eulogy, but it's it's you as a person, maybe that's not how you want to be remembered, as you know, on a grave, but you know. Sorry. And uh, some people also at funerals, you know, they don't want to see the body because they don't want to remember people how they want to remember. They don't want to see them in that state. So it's it's the same situation with, you know, place. Some people may may not want memorials because they want to remember that place is how they remember it or they don't want to have another narrative or whatever it be, a story implanted or, you know, forced for them to accept. So as far as making, you know, a name for yourself or a memory for yourself, it's just everything, just your own cognitive decision. And back to the, you know, every time, I don't know if this is, I think, I don't know who published it, but I read it recently. Every time you do cre recreate a memory, it's, it changes, it's never exactly the same in your, mm -hmm. you know, in your brain. So that's, it's also, you know, it's a distillation of, of a memory of itself. So when you do visit a memorial, are you changing your perception of it each time? Or, or so it's, it's just interesting to, you have one, one idea of it, but it's each time you rethink it, it may change. So it's, it's interesting to think about it that way as well. What I'm interested in, it's not memorials. Of course, we do these kinds of projects. But I'm interested in, in memory. But in memory as an action, as I said yesterday. Memory, again, as a verb, not an object. You know. and, and to me, this is an interesting thing because, you know, if you, if you, even if you look at the writings of uh, Henry Bergson, you know, when he was talking about habit memory, you know, and and duration, you know, the notion that we can uh, apprehend the sense of time only through memory, through the idea of memory, you know. Uh, so there's something about the connection or the connectivity that exists between, you know, fleeting time and knowing that we have a limited span, you know, and, and, and the notion that, that our connection to who we are, identities, are related to memory. That is not the same as subject position, which is, I'm a Holocaust victim, or I'm a victim of September 11, or I'm, you know, it's a very different thing, you know, but many, many of all our identities are constructed through what we remember happened in our lives. If not, it will be a constant construction of identity, which means, you know, the movie Memento, as an example, you know. Uh, so to me, there's something extremely powerful about this, but I mean to see it on expanding the meaning, you know, or the sense of the word mean the, the word memory that has been somehow bracketed 
by many of, let's say, our practices to mean, supposedly, memorial. I'm interested on, on actions. I'm interested on understanding the difference between history and memory or the connectivity that exists between history and memory. And the ethical dimensions of memory, which is not the same as projecting over the past retrospective meaning, which is kind of part of historical science. You, know, you look at the past and you project the mm -hmm. retrospective meaning. I'm interested in, in the notion of what we learn from the past, not only as a historical, but using the imagination. That's why I bring to the front, you know, cases like, you know, the writings by Ernst van Alphen. Fantastic book, 1995, called Caught by History. You know, or, 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 but to me, this is an interesting thing because it's about, you know, perhaps using the lamp analogy or metaphor. Is, is we think that we illuminate the past and we select portions of the past that are perhaps meaningful to us, or we construct meaning through that. But I always try to think of the past is illuminating us. It's more like the Benjamin, the, the Angelos nose, you know, the figure, you know, the kind of Paul Clay, you know. So, we are illuminated by the past, and we have to find a way to make sense of our present. You know? and, and I think, you know, for me, the fascination with memory, you know, comes from the notion that is ever is fleeting and cannot be anchored. That's the ethical dimension. It's not anchored to a, to a one single meaning. Would you, say that, where it's would you say that memorials then become a burden? Maybe we shouldn't be doing them. But, but I don't mean that we can really be over, but if, we, you're, if you're interested in memory, because that's what ties us to this. But I would not preclude, I would not say, well, we should not do this, or we should not do that, or we should not do the following. You know, perhaps myself I have problems with questions of figuration. You know, but that's, you know, but I also have problems with the, the aesthetic pleasure. You know, that comes from pure material and surface. Hardcore. Yeah, I mean, this, to me, there's something very powerful about what we're talking about here and all the presentations that we heard in this in this uh, in this uh, gathering, you know, because perhaps we don't have a final sense of what we should do or what we should not. It's not prescriptive, but 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 to me, the the, the fact that we are looking at the kind of the question of landscape, even Simon Shama, you know, that you mentioned, you know, talk about, you know, that we tend to think that the Holocaust in black and white. And he says in his books, uh, Landscape and Memory, it's very shocking to see that Treblinka be belongs to a very vivid, colorful countryside, I mean, in his, mm -hmm. his words. And when I was, you know, in Auschwitz, you know, when I showed a photo, it was green. And, you know, and, and there's something extremely powerful about the kind of uh, presentia, you know, as you were talking about, but, but perhaps less ontologically and more, you know, kind of phenomenologically, and, and I think this something very powerful about that 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 moment. I mean, the moment I, I walk a place and I smell something, you know, and I, I remember my grandmother's, you know, house, and I tears come to my eyes because she's no longer here with me, but I remember her food, and I was in Odessa, not understanding one single word, yet the food was the same as grandmother's house. That's very powerful. And if we didn't have memory, we couldn't connect these things. I think, Julian, really what you're touching on, I mean, the thread here with memory, that the people are touching on here is memory is, is it's creative. It's, we can't go back, grab a piece of the past, and it's here in its truthful form. It's always going to be creative. And the question is, do we need to do monuments? Are they needed? You know, we can maybe be illuminated by the past, so to speak, about past practice. I don't know, anybody here familiar with, um, I think the author's name is Loa, but Low uh, Lies Across America. Um, yeah, okay, Lowen. Aaron. Lowen, okay. So he took a look at memorials, um, it, basically from like the later part of the 19th century up to maybe the 50s or something like that. Historical markers and how they interpreted history from like an objective factual history. And he basically laid out a narrative that, at least through the 50s, memorials were used to reframe history for some sort of, usually a political means. You know, like uh, Reconstructionist era in the Civil War South. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, the war of northern aggression and, and reframing how all that happened. So I'm not suggesting that that's what we're using memorials for now, but we are, we are interpreting, are. well, in some sense, we're interpreting the past through a narrow lens. We may not realize how narrow it is now, but we revisit what we're doing now, some sort of things in the future, and there's, there's, we're never going to do this perfectly. And, you know, if we're littering the landscape with a lot of memorials, are, are we 
are we going to be the pariahs of the, of the future, so to speak? I, I don't know. I actually, I, I, you know, this comes back to something that came up yesterday, and, and I was thinking about uh, Julian's project in France and the 9 11 war, because it, it has to do with the lens. Um, you know, you're not going to find, I assume, in not, you know, advocates of slavery who are going to protest the construction of a memorial. There may be political opponents to this, but whatever. But you, know, you don't have an opposition to this. Um, with the 9-11 memorial, it's not simply that it's so much more immediate than uh, the, the acts of slavery that are commemorated in Nantes, but you know, it's also the fact that there's still a war going. And you know, the need for that night, and you know, this is really visceral and tangible when you see people visit it. They link that to what's gone on in the world since and to the combat that's still underway. That's, you know, that doesn't really need an education, I mean, it may need an educational effort to sort of temper that and shape that in a way. It doesn't need an educational effort to stimulate that. And, you know, the need for a memorial is also, in this case, you know, more or less tied to the contemporary world, to the problem that we are currently facing. Something that interests me as well is the fact that well, in this conversation about um, the super memorialization or the, the saturation of memorials is the quality of the memorial itself. Mm -hmm. I would say, let's say in the case of Washington DC Mall, we see uh, the, 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 the memorial by Maya Lin stands as itself, as, an, as a place that has its own memories for some people that has been there that does not have to do anything with Vietnam necessarily. I was thinking another example, Guernica from Picasso for me I, I don't have much relation with the civil war in Spain, in, 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 in the north of Spain, but for me, the Guernica from Picasso is more related with the, the lack of Guernica in the Museum of Modern Art of New York when I saw it for the first time in America, and the space that it occupied made it a very important reflection to me. Now when Guernica is not anymore in New York, for me, it's the lack of a Guernica, which, what, I, what I miss in some ways. <laughs> and that brings me to the point of the quality of the memorial itself. Or, or the value of the memorial in itself as a meaning. I don't know what you think about that. You know, it's funny about Guernica. It's, it's actually what people know is that there's a painting named Guernica. They you know much know less. Is, 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 the painting is more right. famous than the actual, the actual the city. The city. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. incredible. When you say Guernica, the you know, Civil War reminded me, you know, a couple of years ago I had the opportunity to participate on, on a conference uh, about the creation of the, what is called the Memorial Democratic, which was a new kind of very interesting institution in, in Catalonia, you know, about the kind of the territory of Catalonia, the Catalan territory in relation to the kind of civil civil war and the 50 years of Fra Franco dictatorship. So one of the things that was interesting, uh, 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 looking at the Catalan model, you know, I remain very much in contact with people who are working there, is is the idea that 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 this story happened in the territory, yeah. you know, and it's a territorial history, you know, and uh, is not you know uh, centered on on one place, and each place has a different story to tell. You know, what interests me about all this issue in relation to kind of again teaching architecture and working about you know, architecture is, is that we can build the same building anywhere in the world, you know. Today we can do it. We can do that. We can build the same kind of building anywhere in the world. But what matters and what changes is the place itself. You know, is the meaning of the place. I think you were talking about is it's the site itself that, that, that constructs. You know, the meaning of the building itself or help us. So to me, it's about kind of the ground of the place. As you were excavating and walking, and these maps of walking, you know, the island are fantastic. It's just, you know, the kind of the, the act of finding is what interests me in this. But to me, what is the tragedy yeah. is that uh, discovering that, you know, half the island mm -hmm. was evacuated for completely, you know, um, what, for reasons that it took me a long time to understand. Now, if we actually look at territories, we could probably identify many such evacuated territories. In that case, what is the meaning of place? You know, I mean, it's, you, you, um, uh, you all of a sudden say, oh, so even these extremely closely held beliefs, um, you know, the meaning of place, all of these really good things that, 
you know, yeah. you know, I, I feel comfortable with, all of a sudden hit me in the face because, in fact, mm -hmm. that's the rupture. And so, the place remains, but uh, you know, over its long durée, I found two moments of you know complete rupture, or well, maybe not a hundred percent, but you know, 85 at least, if not 90. Then what? Um, how do I, what kind of tools do I bring to this ground truth? This, by the way, is also uh, the kind of, um, I mean, to sort of make it into a larger issue, um, you know, we have the territories that were once occupied by nomads. And yeah. then for a variety of reasons, they are occupied by settled folk. So the meaning of a territory to a nomadic society is very, very different uh, than to people who are settlers. Um, you know, well, anyway, I don't want to make it bigger and bigger, big enough already. If there are any last comments, otherwise I'm going to make the last comments, which I really thank everyone. Um, when we set off on this adventure, I mean, when Cliff and I first discussed this, and he said, this is a good thing to do, um, I, I was kind of skeptical. It's not my thing in many ways. I deal with other things in architecture. But it, was, it became more and more important and more and more interesting to me as we, as we went along a little while, a while back. Then we weren't going to do it. Then we finally did it, uh, this, this thing. But the conversation has been going on for a little while on this. But I'm very glad that we did it. And I uh, was interested that I saw this, I saw yesterday and today as, as two related conversations, but slightly different ones, in the sense that yesterday seemed to be much more about remembering and continuity, and today seemed to be much more about rupture and change. I don't know. It's very interesting. They were both part of the same, two sides of the same coin, I guess. And what is nice is that the conversation came together in some ways, even from very different presentations. Some of you are very skillful, by the way, in tying everything together. I'm most grateful for that. Um, and I would like to just thank all of you for participating in this and the richness of uh, what had happened. I would just li like to end with saying the usual sort of thing. I want to thank Steve White, who is not here, who had to leave for something. He was going to be back, but I guess he's not, so we won't wait for him. I want to thank Cliff thank you, for being my partner in this uh, endeavor of trying to help us put this together. Um, the Sue Contente, who you've all met at some point, she did all the logistics, ran around, we drove her crazy. We still probably will for the next few weeks, but she was terrific. And I want to thank her. And I want to thank Rand as well, because he did all the graphics in the last few days, put all this stuff together, put the folders, helped us and has been ferrying people back and forth and will continue to do so. Um, Maya Farrell, who you've met, who's not with us either, helped and supported this activity um, with the Newport stuff. Uh, so we've been to Newport before to the, to the, in, in the series, but this is the first time we dined there. And I want to thank Trudy Cox, who I should have thanked yesterday, and I regret not doing it over dinner. She wasn't there. She's the one who made it possible for us to use use the, uh, the house and so on. And she and her staff, we met some of them. I have a couple of, two, three or four colleagues, I think. Um, Julian, I'd like to thank him because he, when we discussed this, he gave me a bunch of ideas, names, people, things we should do, and I'm grateful for that. And that applies to Bob Cowherd as well. Bob who, through various attempts, we tried various other things, which some worked, and so finally they did, they did work, and I'm glad. And, um, I'd like to thank you as well, Jeremy, for your early conversations about what we're going to do. And Philip, Philip Marshall, who was very supportive of this activity and has helped in many different ways over the years. So I'm sure I'm going to leave out people, but that's, that's the way this goes. Um, but I really thank our speakers for coming. I'm, I appreciate this greatly because you've made this what I think is a pretty rich, has been a pretty rich conversation. And uh, so for all of you who came in different distances and stayed out in the farm or whatever you did, <laughs> you know, bumbled around the place. That is a nice place. It's a nice farm, right? It's a nice farm. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good place to be. It's the nicest place, it's the nicest place in the area, let me tell you by far. Um, so I want to, again, just say 
thanks all of you and the students who have attended, who are going to continue this conversation with me over the next few weeks, um, a bunch of them. And so I look forward to this. And hopefully we'll meet again next year on a different subject, a different time. I haven't done this for f four years, but I did it every year. This is the ninth, the ninth one, I think, that I've done. Um, few of you have been here before. Um, Cliff's been here before, and I think Fred has been here, he said five times. I didn't quite realize this is your... This is five. This is five, okay, well, <laughs> you know. So we get some older, I mean older being people who've been here before. get some new ones. So the mix has been terrific. So anyway, thank you all very much. And Can I say very something? Much As part of the faculty here, I want to thank uh, especially Hassan and Cliff, but you know the fact that you took the time to organize this, uh, this event, this conference, and, and, and get us all together, I think deserves another big hand. Yeah.